are listening to The Flip Side with Noah Filipiak, connecting the reality of the gospel to the grit of life. You can support the podcast at patreon.com slash noahfilipiak or at noahfilipiak.com slash give. What up? Welcome to episode 20 of The Flip Side Podcast. We're back twice. Like we were back episode 19. The dust is continuing to settle back into a normal rhythm of podcasting. I got to admit, a little sad, a little sad. I was thinking episode 19 would come. Everybody was waiting. Like, when is there going to be a real episode? I'm going to listen. I'm going to tell 100 of my friends to listen. And episode 19, I'll be honest, it needs a little love. Needs a little love. So if you haven't yet listened to episode 19... Please go do that. It's crying. I've had to console it regularly. It needs a little bit of love. So check out episode 19 after you listen to episode 20 or before. It doesn't matter. But the podcast is back. It's good to be back after a long, stressful couple months, which I kind of outline in that episode. Oh, yeah, that episode's half as long, so I don't know if... I thought maybe you guys would like that. Like, hey, this one's only 45 minutes. As you know, some tend to go an hour and a half, but maybe some of you didn't like that. Maybe some of you were like, what's the point? I love three-hour episodes, so 45 minutes isn't even a real episode. I don't know. Maybe if that's what the market research is telling me, then I'm going to have to make the people happy and give you two-hour episodes again. So we'll see. We'll, We'll see what happens. We'll see how the downloads look. After this little this little promo. So speaking of off and running, the Flipside Book Club is off and running. So I introduced that last podcast episode. A new thing I'm going to be doing on the podcast and with my blog, which is simply noahflipiak.com. We are reading currently Mere Sexuality by Todd A. Wilson. It's not too late. If you want to join the book club, head over to the blog and you'll figure out from there how to join. But basically, this is a way I want to be reading more books. I think you want to be reading more books. I read books if there's accountability. I read books well in a seminary class if there's a professor and there's assignments due. And so I just created the seminary class. So just today, November 15th, posted the introduction and... Chapter one, uh, my reflections on those as well as discussion for those. So check those out. I don't want to repeat content. I want you to read that on the blog. But it was a really good start to the book. And one trend that I thought was interesting that I didn't talk much about in my blog reflection was this trend that, and, and Wilson doesn't get into this yet. I think he might later in the book. I don't know. Haven't read it yet. But... This is what I think of when I think of the cultural trends of sexuality, be it heterosexual and or homosexual, all kind of in one bag. There's this trend where we now reject authority. So don't come and tell me what I should do or how I should live, whether it's the church or society. I'm going to define what marriage is. I'm going to define what a family is. I'm going to do whatever I want sexually. And what was interesting is the book begins to hint at some cultural trends about authority in general, specifically about scripture. A lot of the book has to do with the church's view of scripture and how has that changed over time. So that to me is a pretty fascinating conversation in and of itself. But it just got me thinking about this concept of authority and not just sexually, but across the board, we've equated freedom with Nobody can tell me what to do. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. And then, of course, there's consequences to that, both on a societal level as well as on a personal level. So I want to keep most of the discussion around the book club on the blog. There's a comment section in there. And so if you want to jump in and comment and you're not reading along, that's fine as well. And if you are reading along, if you want to read along, if you want to join, there's a way to do that as well. So check that out. I'll continue to give little plugs here on the podcast for it. And when this one's over, we're going to pick up another book and we're going to do it again. So right now we have five people and myself in the book club, which I think is pretty great. I'm pretty excited. So check that out. 
and maybe I'll talk more about this I do what my body wants thing again, but I don't want to take too much more time of it here. Today on the podcast, we are going to be interviewing Jason Redoudi. I I initially uh, teased, is that the word? I teased this interview way back on episode 10. And you've been waiting. I know. You've been waiting months. Like, when is he going to interview Jason Redoudi? The world famous Jason Redoudi. Well, that interview is today. Your wait is is my. <laughs> I make your dreams come true. Is that I, I I your your wait has been satisfied. The wait is now over. So I'm going to be interviewing Jason today. Jason is a good friend. He lives in Lansing, where I lived for 15 years. He runs the ministry Hearts Alive and Free. He has an amazing story testimony of just sort of the sexual wreckage of his own life, of doing what his body wanted, and that being his authority, and then where he's at today, uh, being married and and helping others in their marriages and in their sexual purity, whether they're single or married, and just what that looks like for him. So before we get to the interview with Jason, which we're going to do next, and after the interview, we will have Noah's rant, we're going to do a little mailbag. So I told you in the last episode, I'm giving Rob his own segment for a little while. He wrote the, this awesome email in. It has it was way too long <laughs> to read in one episode, but it was about small groups. It is in reference to episode 13 when I asked listeners to send in uh, email about what they thought of small groups or small groups, church small groups. So they positives, negatives. My official title now is a small groups pastor at my job. And so wanted to get your thoughts. So you got to listen back to last episode, episode 19 in the Rob segment of the mailbag to get the full context of Rob's beginning of his email. And he lays out five different types of experiences he's had in small groups. Last time I read the competition which I'm not going to read again. This time I will read competition part two. Couples small group. Ouch. I don't think my wife will ever do couples groups again. Competition takes on a whole new meaning. Who is the cutest couple? Pretending or wanting to be previewed as a loving couple. Perfect parents and more loving than the other couples in the room. The list could go on, but my experience was similar with guys. Sorry, read that wrong. But often my experience was similar with guys. Real issues of life and marriage were commonly skimmed over for fear of being exposed for having real problems in my marriage when no one else seemed to be having any problems. Have you ever had that type of issue in your small group experience? What could be done about that surface level experience in a small group? Think about that. I'm not going to give you a ton of my thoughts on it because we're going to keep coming back to this topic each and every time. But maybe at the very end, segment five of the Rob segment of the mailbag, uh, we'll talk more about that. Episode 13 gives you a great sort of context of my take on small groups. And so check it out. That'll close up the mailbag. If you want to mail the show, please do so. Podcast at beyondthebattle.net. Would love to hear from you and interact with your questions or comments on the air. Next, we are heading to Lansing, Michigan to check in with the one, the only, Jason Redoudi. All right. Welcome to the podcast, Jason, my favorite driver's ed teacher in the whole world. Welcome. <laughs> it's good to, good to be with you, man. So look, I got an important driver's ed question for you before we get started. I'm you, your answer, man. You are my driver's ed instructor. So, so I honk at people a lot when I drive because mm, I, think, I think that I am their driver's ed instructor. Like people do, they do stupid things. And so I honk at them to tell them, hey, what you just did was stupid. You're stupid. 
and you need to stop doing that or you're going to kill somebody. So I feel like I'm doing them a favor. Not only will they not kill someone, but I'm saving a life. Like they would have killed someone that I just saved because I, I honked at them. Now they won't do that behavior anymore. But my wife, she, she disagrees. She thinks I have some kind of problem and she tells me I need to honk at people less. And so I'm just, I'm just curious what your take is on, on honking and, uh, you know, am I right in saving people's lives by, by honking so at them? So I agree with your motives and your intent. Let me ask you a question. Do you think they receive that message well? You know, do you think they're like, oh my gosh, thank you, Noah. I now realize the error of my ways. I will completely change my belief system and all right, my driving right. habits that I've yeah. accumulated for 20 years because of that sound I just heard from you. Pro thank you well, so much, I think Professor, I like Professor Philippiak. It's kind of like sharing the gospel, right? So, your responsibility is just to share the message. Just tell them about the gospel and about Jesus. And really, it's between God and them at that point to do the rest. So I, I sort of see that way. It's not really my responsibility if it has an effect or if they receive it, but I am accountable to just giving them the message. So that's kind so of you're like this, this, the guy on the street with the, with the weird sign saying you're going to hell? Well, you know, I mean, he might, he might be doing more good than, a message. Than, than somebody never, you know, doing anything. I've, I've heard people, I have met people that have come to yeah. know Jesus through, through that guy. So everyone's got a lane. Yeah. So, so you think I shouldn't honk at people. You think that's being like unloving, unchrist like No, I think it's, so I, I'm typically, I'm a non-honker overall because my goal is to never, ever be in a crash. Okay. And so everything I do in a car serves that interest. And it typically doesn't serve that interest to honk. There's almost zero upside and some potential downside if you get someone who well, really I, doesn't want to be honked at. I disagree. I'm ending this interview right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, good thing my wife doesn't listen to the podcast because she would be like, I told you so. Oh, nice. So, yeah, nice. yeah. All right, I want to hear your best driver's ed story because it's got to be terrifying oh, sometimes to drive with someone who doesn't know how to drive. So. I mean, have you almost died ever? Like, have I've, you, has it, I've has almost it, died a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's an interesting job where sometimes multiple times a week, I just take a deep breath and I say, man, what am I, what am I doing getting into a car with people who can't drive, <laughs> can't but drive. think they can drive, by the way. You know, when they're coming for a test, they think they can drive. Uh, and sometimes they're grossly misinformed by someone maybe, or maybe just themselves or they haven't had any formal training. But yeah, it, it can be, I try not to be mad at them. I for almost have killing to, you. Yeah, yeah, because really, they may not necessarily be malicious or, or stupid, but I feel like, what are you doing? How could you do that to me? So, yeah, it's it's tough, man. But there's um, I mean, a very typical scenario is, um, our lane is ending. They have to get over. I can see that they aren't seeing that our lane is ending <laughs> and I'm looking and there's people next to us Yes, at the last, I'm giving them every chance to do the right thing and check and look and signal and negotiate with traffic. But in the end I have to, you know, scream, grab the wheel, take evasive <laughs> action from the passenger seat. And then right. that's an automatic failure on the test. So it, yeah, there's a lot of times where I think, what am I doing in this car? But then my teaching heart takes over and I try to help them see that they're not ready. And in the end, um, I think, you know, how you handle people's hearts can matter. I, I tell them they can be mad for failing, but I tell them, you know, you don't want to be in a car by yourself if you don't yeah. know what you're doing. <laughs> That's Cause true. you don't get points off. You get hurt and get killed. Right. And you don't want that. You don't want to be in a car if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Well, you keep, you keep taking my stupid driver's ed questions and making them all serious and spiritual. So I'm just, <laughs> I can tell that's where you want to go. I can feel the vibe in the room. So let's just go there you know, now. It's funny because I am passionate about it. I, I, it's something that I, I have a teaching heart, but it's yeah. really where most people's uh, reality comes to the surface every day. Because I mean, the most likely reason that you or me or someone that we know is going to get killed is because of a decision made in a car. Yeah. So there are, you know, I say people want to, you know, travel all over the world and, and save lives and save the whales and have these causes, which is great. But this is <laughs> probably the single best thing you can do to make our world a better place is to drive safe. Man, that's awesome. No, for real. You should do that for your living. That's <laughs> <laughs> I, I, am, uh, I am passionate about it. I'm passionate about podcasting. My goal is to do this for my living. Um, 
I'm going to re- just quit my job and podcast all the time. By the way, I love the flip side, which by yeah, the way, thanks. for listeners, you've been pumping me like I'm a celebrity or something. Yeah. You've oh, been you talking should hear like three episodes. Oh, you should hear the oh, intro to wait. this one. I'm going to get, I'm going to oh, get yeah. Jason Rodowdy on. I already, I'm like, it, dude, I, no one knows who Jason Rodowdy I, is. <laughs> oh, they will now. They will now after you've been on the episode <laughs> of the flip side. I mean, this, this podcast is like number three in the, in the nation for like podcasts that nobody <laughs> listens to. Um, <laughs> so, the intro to this one, which I've already recorded, can't go back now. Uh, man, yeah, it's good. It's really good. You should make sure like your kids listen to it. They'll be like, wow, my dad's famous. <laughs> Here's what I love. Uh, I do my mailbag, and granted, I, I have no shame on this show. Like, I don't I pretend. Love I, love I, don't pretend I love the mailbag. I love it. <laughs> I don't pretend like this show is like famous or popular. So I will read people's mail on the show, and I love getting mail. Yeah. And here, here, here's a here's a, a an inside secret. Don't tell anybody this, Jason. I don't get a lot of mail. Don't tell my listeners that. Okay, I don't get a lot of mail. In I, other words, if someone mails you, it will be read. Yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> like I'm like yes, like I'm desperate for mail, right? And so whenever I read someone's mail, not whenever, but like several times, two or three times, I've had uh, people like re- email me back, or like a friend of a friend recently was like, dude, you just my. <laughs> You read my friend's email and he was pumped. Like he, he had his kids listen to it and they thought he was so cool. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, I love that. Yeah. He's like not- kids, the no, t- the no notion of what is celebrity now is kind of interesting <laughs> or like to get on, I, like I used to get on TV, but for any time there's a driver's ed question, like right, the local right. news would interview me. And that was, yeah. used to be a big deal. Everyone saw it. Right. Like, I mean, next day, like dozens of people, Hey, I saw you on the news. Saw you on the news. Yes. And in the past two years, I've been on the news. Like, six times and like there's been like two or three people each time like my parents being one of them right. no one watches the news they're all over 60 and my kids yeah. think you're famous if there's a video on facebook <laughs> right I'm like you know you understand we can just make a video and put it on there that's right that's right i love it i i, I love but, it. hey all you need is a, 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 a few rabid fans right that's that's, that's right the, that's the formula if, if you if i'm you one want of them man i love you hey i and i love the flip side I appreciate that. And you love to say that you love me. You're one of those people. Like I have these certain friends and you are always like, I love you. And I'm like, I love you too. But I am <laughs> weird about saying I love you all the time yeah. to my guy friends. But I do, I do, I do love you. And I do say it back and it always feels weird. It. it feels like when I first had to call my in-laws, like mom and dad, the first few yeah. years of marriage, it's, a little awkward. it's like, yeah. So I love you too. I love yeah. you too. But I, I have I'm a pride that. issue and I need to, I, you know, so I'm glad that you, you pushed me. In that Has it always direction. been that way? Uh, what was it? My brother, my middle brother, who's probably listening, Pete, he, he started what saying, up, I, I love you all the time to me, like in our adult life. And I'm like, Pete, I love you too. I don't want to say I love you all the time. Hmm. <laughs> so yeah, I love you, Pete. He'll like that. He'll, he'll I like don't that. know you, Pete, but I, w- I bet I would love you. You love everybody. You that's that's that's, uh, that's my default setting. Do, do you know the Enneagram? Have you you're familiar? I am familiar. Yeah, I'm not like a okay. scholar, but I've listened I, to things, read some things. I I did an Enneagram episode at some point on here back back in the day, and I think uh, you'd probably put me at a super strong seven. You're the biggest seven I've I've ever met, <laughs> which is awesome. You're amazing. You're like yeah. a you're like a puppy that never stops licking you. It's like yeah. amazing. So I love well, that. There's a, I mean I I before the Enneagram language came to the zeitgeist i would always say that there's gifts but there's also dark side there's a dark side to each gift absolutely yeah so what i hope is that my willingness to put a silver lining on things does not come at the expense of feeling deeply and feeling all the emotions yeah yeah which i'd say it was before in my former life yeah yeah we're gonna talk we're gonna i hope it it isn't anymore no i i hear what you're saying yeah let's uh Let's jump into that now. I got a couple of different places I want to go, um, but uh, you kind of bio stuff. You you run or help run Hearts Alive and Free. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but let's just jump into kind of your story, kind of the way I, I led up to. We're also going to talk about the quote: "When the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of change, that's when people change." That was back on episode ten when I first mentioned that quote which by the way i thought you were super super vulnerable on that and i loved it cool i loved it because it's not a it's the other side of of 
well, the, the metaphor that I use is it's the good, it's the good side of the bad tree. Like the bad side of the bad tree is, you know, indulgence of the flesh and yeah. um, being ruled over by your sin. And what we traditionally think of as, you know, I'm a, I'm a drunk, I'm a womanizer, I'm a liar, I'm a cheater, I'm a stealer. Those are kind of traditional ways that we can be ruled, ruled over by sin. But if you're living on the good side of the bad tree, you can also be ruled over by sin by trying to not do it so much mm-hmm. and by being self-sufficient and being a perfectionist. And it's, I think, I thought it was well articulated. Most people you, in your situation, you would say that your, um, you know, your struggle from the outside looks like success. Yes. And looks like you're a great guy and that you're doing great things for the world. And, and maybe you are, but at the expense of what, in, in your case, your family, your soul, your sanity, yeah. um, your health, mental and, and physical well being. Yeah. And it's, I thought you articulated it really, really well that everyone knows about the guy in the gutter with, you know, shooting up heroin or whatever. That's, that's, that guy's struggling. He's suffering. He's in a bad spot, but to be in a, in a, in a very similar, similarly bad spot, like you were, because you're stretched too thin and you're trying to be everything to everybody and you can't say no to things that are good things. Yeah. And I thought, I just thought it was cool because it's not often. And I'll, I, I, did you feel weird about, do you feel like you're, I don't know, like it doesn't count. It's not as big of a deal. Like, cause you're not in an alleyway that you're not at the end of your rope in a rehab center or something like that. Does it feel not as, not as valid? No, I don't think so because I have to, I'm the one that suffers from yeah. it. You know, like I think somebody could look at it that way and, and just say like, oh, that's not real suffering. And like, it's, it's miserable. Like it's, it's like, it's miserable and it, it is an addiction. It's an addiction. Like, like you say, I'm yeah. going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop doing this. And then you just keep going back to it. And you, you literally say, how did I get myself into this again? And by miserable, it's like, depression comes on sometimes I've never been suicidal uh but I often in those those seasons of depression are like I just want to die you know just and just God like take me you know come yeah. and I, <laughs> try to spiritualize it like Jesus just come back you know but really it's like just it's it's really ironic because you try to do so much stuff and then you're because like there's so much to be done mm-hmm. and then your only solution is to stop to, to end it to, to just like everything must stop. Well, that's, that's actually the, like, it doesn't make any sense for somebody that wants right. to get a whole bunch of stuff done. You know, you'd think yeah. if you just did things at a healthy pace, like you're supposed to like, yeah. well, like I should, I don't want you supposed to like, that's kind of shame based, but like, sure. Just the way God designed us where there's a healthy Sabbath, there's healthy mm-hmm. self care, mm-hmm. there's healthy, like you do your part and we're all going to do our part and God's going to get the glory for it. That then you, you actually get a lot more done. You actually are more, you're more successful. You get more done. Um, so yeah, when I talk about that, I speak out of a real sense of pain, you know, a real a, a, a place of of real pain. And man, so many people I know, especially in ministry, they are struggling with the same stuff. And there just needs to be more people talking about it because you're right; it's wor- It's almost worse when that behavior is rewarded. Like if you're a porn addict, oh, yeah. nobody yeah. in the church is like, "Ah, you're a porn addict. You're my hero." Like. Uh, but if you're like a success addict, then you, you get celebrated and, and you, get, you even get high on the celebration. And it's just like, it's a really dark cycle eventually. Yeah. It's, it, I, I mean, the, I have a path analogy where, you know, the path that I was on um, was bad and I knew it was bad. Um, you know, didn't know how I got on the path, didn't under, understand the path, but knew that when things went wrong, it's because I was on the wrong path. And yet, it, so it was very easy for me when I hit that kind of rock bottom, that place where I knew that the pain of staying the same was greater than the pain of change. I knew I needed to get on a different path, that I was on the wrong road. In the case of guys like you who struggle with that kind of self-sufficiency, do it for God um, kind of thing, when you, when you fail, your first reaction, your default isn't that I'm on the wrong road. It's that I haven't gone far enough on the road yet. I'm not yeah. perfect enough. I haven't had enough devotion.